today I have a very distinguished panel. Um, it's, a, it, it, it's a great joy and honor to have, to have them with us. I have, um, they're all doctors, so I'm not going to refer to anyone as doctor. Um, Chedozi Egesi, who is a plant breeder by training, and he's also the project director for NextGen. NextGen is the project that is responsible for supporting IITA and um, national partners to put out the varieties that we are going to talk about. Chidoz is also a faculty member with Cornell Global Development and the School of Integrative Plant Science. We also have with us um, Ismail Rabi. Um, Dr. Rabi is a molecular genetic geneticist and a plant breeder. He's based at IITA in Ibadan, Nigeria. And he's also, we, today we also have Dr. Siraj Kayondo. He is a molecular breeder with IITA. They are both based in Ibadan, Nigeria, and they are in the same room on the same laptop. So we are excited to have you. And finally, we have um, our lady panelist, Tessi Madu, who is um, a research scientist and a gender specialist. She works with the National Root Crops Research Institute, Umudike in Nigeria. So what are these four um, distinguished panelists going to talk to us about today? On December 17th, just before um, 2020 came to an end, um, five new cassava varieties were released in Nigeria. They have interesting names, Game Changer, Hope, Obasanjo 2, Baba 70, and Poundable. So they were released by IITA, and IITA was supported by NextGen. What does this mean? This means that NextGen, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and United Kingdom's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, works hand in hand with research institutes like um, the National Root Crops Research Institute in Nigeria and IITA to, to breed and come up with varieties. And IITA and Omudike came up with these varieties and they released them in Nigeria. So quite a long introduction. I would like to immediately go to um, Chidozi, the project leader, like I said, to tell us just quite briefly why cassava um, why cassava? Because for me, as someone who has lived in Nigeria, I loved, I loved yam. Why not yam? What does this mean um, to the people and the economy of Nigeria? Over to you, Chidozi. Thank you. And let's opportunity to thank you and appreciate for inviting and asking that next gen. As a privilege that we will be able to milestones and the things we've been doing in recent times. Um, I also have a correction to make regarding the release of the variety. Um, the release of the varieties by the national program and in Nigeria is a national root crops research institute Modike, that releases varieties. But next gen supported. IITA and the National Root Crops Research Institute to develop those develop and evaluate those varieties. So that the mandate for release belongs to NRCRI. And um, we are glad that the NextGen project supported this effort. Um, NextGen, that, that the Gates Foundation also supported, Gates Foundation and the FCDO, UK's FCDO supported the effort to um, Next Gen Cassava to make those releases. Next Gen Cassava is a project that is aimed at uh, improving the, at accelerating the rate of genetic gains for cassava. But beyond that, we have been into, uh, we, we are about the smallholder farmer, the smallholder farmer in, in Sub-Saharan Africa that grows cassava. How to improve their lives is a whole thing. Uh, that NextGen is about, how to make that in an innovative manner. So in the past few years, we've been able to modernize cassava breeding in Africa. In fact, the world, we've been able to, as a flagship project, as a, as a flagship cassava breeding project in the world, we've been able to modernize plant breeding in Brazil, Colombia, 
um, Nigeria, Uganda, and Tanzania. And we're also doing that in other countries in Africa, in, 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 in Ghana, in Sierra Leone, Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda, um, Mozambique, Zambia. I can mention a lot of them, about seven of them, Kenya also. So we are, we are working in different African countries at different capacities. We've been able to train people on how to use the new modern tools to breed for cassava. We, we are, we, we've been able to develop a database, a cassava base is a, is, a, is a premium database for cassava improvement used and is free for anybody in the world that cares. We've been able to develop molecular markers that are used all of, um, in different parts of the world, like um, molecular markers for uh, mosaic disease resistance is being used in Asia. Asia didn't have the virus disease, but now we have the markers that is helping them to breed for resistance to mosaic disease. But most importantly is our gender responsive cassava breeding. It is a gender responsive demand led breeding that we are working on. And Tessie Madu on the panel is going to talk a lot more about it. But it's about how we engage different um, uh, people involved in, in the, in, as stakeholders in the cassava industry, like women, um, processors, how do we consider their input and their needs when we are selecting for new varieties? That is what we have been able to demonstrate. I can stop there for now. Thank you. Um, thank um, finally, you. finally, finally, Patricia, um, a few weeks ago, we were able to release the five varieties in Nigeria. We're also having about three or four varieties in Uganda to release and the uh, uh, same number in Tanzania. So we, we have quite a lot going on and this in the pipeline. Oh, Thank you. Okay, that's, that, that's interesting and good to know that um, there'll be, there is more release um, in, in, in different partner countries. But before we continue, I would like to make a clarification. These five varieties were released specifically for the Nigerian market. It is not the same varieties that you're going to take to Uganda and Tanzania. Is that right? Yes, this is basically for the Nigerian market because what we have done, and I don't want to go too deep into it, is to develop what you call product profiles that are country specific or region, sub-region specific. So the one for East Africa is different from the one from West Africa. But the good thing about the one for West Africa is that we have a seed system in West Africa, ECOWA supported, that once you release a variety in Nigeria, you can easily simply take it to um, a country like in any of the ECOWAS country like Ghana, Togo, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, and those varieties will come on as, um, as a variety that has been extensively tested in, in Nigeria, in, in the neighborhood country. And so they can be released without a lot of hassle. Okay, Chidozi, thank you for that um, clarification. So for today, let us focus on Nigeria and the West, you know, the West African market generally. And just a small reminder to our panelists as we continue, I would request that we try to be as brief as possible in our responses, because we want to hear more from our participants in case they have questions. And I would like to now continue with, um, with um, Dr. Rabi. Um, Dr. Rabi, like I told you, is a molecular geneticist and plant breeder with IITA. And Dr. Rabi, of these five varieties, which ones we, we need you to talk to us about them? What advantage is in them? What, what disease, um, what are they, what is that the advantage? Let me not preempt your answer. You can choose just one or two to, to talk to us about. Uh, thank you very much, uh, just to be, to be heard. Um, so we released five varieties. Uh, as Chedozi said, these varieties are um, serving different market segments. Uh, we have three main market segments that we uh, targeted these varieties for. The first market segment is for what we call granulated uh, and paste products. So in West Africa and in Nigeria specifically, cassava is consumed as processed uh, product where they grate, they dewater, sometimes they ferment, and then they can uh, roast in open uh, uh, pan, or they can just ferment and then use that paste to prepare what we call fufu, which is like uh, ugali in East Africa. And so this is the pipeline we call granulated and paste products. The second pipeline 
is the cassava for industry. This is cassava that has high starch, high dry matter content, and they're targeting uh, production of uh, industrial products like starch or even the, the paste and granulated products, but an, on an industrial scale. And then the third pipeline that we have is the fresh consumption. So the fresh consumption is cassava variety that you can take from the field, no need to process, just peel, cut into small pieces, boil, and you can eat. Uh, we know that cassava has cyanogenic to toxicity. And uh, there's some varieties that are actually in high cyanide content and you need to process them before you can consume. But the varieties for this market segments, they have low cyanide content such that you can actually harvest, uh, uh, cook or boil and then uh, consume. So for these three market segments, we have released two varieties for industry. We have released two varieties for granulated and paste products that is Gary and Fufu. And we have released one variety for the fresh market consumption uh, segment. So I'll just briefly mention two of them for the industry. Uh, we have in Nigeria, mainly one variety called TME419 that's dominating the, the, the industry in this uh, uh, production uh, segment. We have two varieties called, one called Game Changer and the second one called Obasanjo 2. Uh, the first one, and the second one, they both have high yield and the distinguishing characteristic for them is high dry matter content. So they have dry matter content of almost 40%. And this is what the industry desires in addition to the high yield. They're all disease resistant. You cannot release a variety in Nigeria that is susceptible, for example, to Casanova mosaic disease. That is the dominant disease in, in West Africa. Uh, they are also re resistant or tolerant to other predominant uh, biotic constraints, like for example, bacterial blight and the anthracnose disease and uh, uh, pests like cassava medibug and cassava green mites. So very briefly, the, in, in this market segment, I want to mention those two. I think I'll come back. I think I'll come back to the other two. Yes, um, Dr. Rabbi, before you go, I think um, Dr. Kayondo will talk to us about the other two, but I want to ask you for some clarification. When you say that um, these two varieties, Game Changer and Obasanjo 2, they have 40% dry matter content, what um, generally the other varieties, the unimproved varieties or previously improved varieties on the market, what was their dry matter content? Uh, the, the, the best current variety that we have in the market is about 35, at most 35% dry matter content. And the ones that follow that, they're even less, 33%. So when you convert okay. your roots into starch, yes, this starch. so you have 35 or 40% dry matter, that means you will have high percentage of starch yield. Okay. And they are also disease resistant. You've told us about cassava mosaic. What other disease are they resistant to? Uh, they are resistant to cassava bacterial blight. Okay. Uh, that means they show very minimal symptoms and the high pressure. They are also tolerant to pests that are predominant, in, for example, in the dry season in West Africa, which is cassava grimite. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, to our participants joining us on Zoom, you are very welcome. Those of you who are joining us on Facebook, you're also very welcome. If you have a question, please put it in the chat. Um, kindly do not raise your hands because we shall, not, um, we shall not be able to give you opportunity to speak, but you can type out your questions and we shall pass them over to, to our panelists. And, but thank you very much for joining us. We are very excited to have you. Next, I would like to talk to um, Dr. Kayondo. At the beginning, I said I'm not going to say doctor, but I guess I am just used to saying it. So I scratch that. So Dr. Ismail Kayondo, um, Ismail Siraj Kayondo is also joining us from IITA and he's a molecular breeder with IITA. So briefly, but um, elaborately, if that is possible. Please talk to us about um, HOPE and, and, and BABA 70, and I think 
poundable. Yeah, thank you and welcome to all the viewers. Who are, uh, we are very privileged to talk to you about some of these uh, varieties. Uh, like the previous speakers have said, uh, we, uh, these varieties have been, uh, were, have been selected over some period of time to ensure that they meet the, uh, the kind of the needs of the people. Uh, for example, when you look at hope, Hope and the Baba 70 have been selected because they've really shown excellent performance when it comes to Gari and Fufu production. And in Nigeria, Fufu and Gari, when you talk of Fufu and Gari, you're basically talking about uh, the day-to-day -day livelihood of people in Nigeria. So these are varieties that have actually been uh, evaluated over time. And when you look at Fufu and Gari, these are just products that come out and are related to dry matter content. So from what we see, from what we've seen from these varieties, we see that these varieties have been exceptional. And uh, from, uh, in, terms of yield, in terms of yield of fufu, so for example, uh, for gari, for hope, some, uh, a farmer is expected, is expected to get something close to, to over 20% uh, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the harvest. So that compares, is actually far better than the varieties that have been within the market. And this brings us to a level that uh, we have been setting ourselves targets of moving, of hitting over 20% of, uh, of the yield of Gari. And when you look at Baba 70, much of the north of Nigeria is uh, looking at cassava as a boiled product. So Baba 70 has actually been also good in terms of uh, its uh, adaptation to uh, dry environments, but also uh, be, its low cyanic potential makes it you know, really good for that uh, market segment. So these are really uh, varieties that we think that are going to respond to the hunger, uh, to, to response to hunger, but that is uh, a major target by the Nigerian government. And we should be able to see many people improving lives and have also mm -hmm. having some earning out of these varieties. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Kayondo. I would like to take you back slightly. When you say that um, for hope, you can get 20% of Gari and Fufu. Mm -hmm. um, what what, what the, the best, the current and best variety on the market, what percentage does, does the farmer get when after they process it? So the best variety that uh, may, many farmers have actually been uh, using, which is four and nine, you, uh, you could get something like 15 or less of Gari okay. Fufu. And having something that is about 20, 23% is really reasonable. And uh, so, you, like uh, uh, Dr. Rabia said, you see we have uh, processors that are also specializing in processing gari and fufu, which serves the market of Nigeria in the biggest part of the western and eastern part of Nigeria. So they are actually seeing a lot of hope in terms of productivity. So me, that ah. means that... Mm, so so right. that explains so, the name, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's why we have Hope and Baba 70 uh, as the names. Thank okay. You. So from your explanation, I have understood why this particular variety is called Hope, because it is promising more income actually from the same yield. So that right. is understandable. That is Hope. Um, mm -hmm. How about Game Changer? It's Dr. Rabi who talked about Game Changer. Just briefly, why did you choose that name? Um, we, we chose that game, uh, name Game Changer because uh, for industry, there's only one dominant variety, that is TME419 in Nigeria. And uh, we think this one from the in the market. And that's why we, we did that. So not us, but the farmers actually who test uh, Exactly, exactly. All put together. Yes, please, Dr. Rabi, and we can that. continue. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, just to add to what is my thing, the last variety, which is the the one that is called poundable, poundable is a, it is actually a local land race that um, uh, researchers in Nigeria were able to collect from other countries in West Africa. Uh, it's a, a very old land race, but very good in terms of. It's uh, cooking quality, very sweet when you boil it, 
it softens within 15 to 20 minutes of boiling, it becomes soft and mealy. And I think in the ancient times, it was a common variety, but it was lost. Um, yes. So ITA and NRC arrived, they did a collection a long time ago, and they've been testing it. And finally, we decided that it is a variety that is worth the registration and released officially uh, in the system. And I think uh, there is a market segment for it, not only in Nigeria, but across Africa for this kind of... Um, I would like now to move over to, to Tessie, which is, um, Tessie is, is from the National Root Crops Research Institute. And like Dr. Rabi has told us, those are the people who are responsible for bringing back that almost lost land race, which we are calling poundable. So Tessie is here specifically and most importantly to talk, talk to us about gender. Why, I have two questions for, for Tessie. And I also noticed uh, um, questions are coming in from the audience. So after Tessie, we shall take audience questions. So Tessie, why is it important to, to, to consider gender when you're breeding and how is that done? Okay, and, and of all these five varieties, what, what was the gender consideration before they were released? So um, over to you, Tessie. We are involved in um, identifying the cassava traits preferences, priorities and realities of uh, men and women, and adequately address them in the design and application in next gen breeding project and uh, so that both men and women benefit from the um, work of uh, breeding. It is important that uh, we do that because the final recipient of uh, every research work, especially cassava, are the farmers. And the farmers are involved at the beginning, at the end. We have a project, uh, we do a, a, a participatory varietal selection. And in this participatory varietal selection, we uh, use a, a tricot technology. This tricot technology is triodic comparison of um, technologies. Here, a lot of farmers are involved. In Nigeria, we're working with about 320 farmers, both male and female, across the four geopolitical regions of uh, Nigeria. And each of these uh, farmers are given a package containing three varieties. And these varieties are expected for, uh, uh, we expect the farmers to plant, grow the cassava, evaluate for us. And uh, the farmers are included, uh, we have male and female cassava in this um, tricot uh, technology. And they grow and evaluate for us and simple evaluation they do is best and worst. That is each of the variety. And they're supposed to do this from planting to harvesting to processing. And they were able to do this after an initial training given to them. And um, at the end of it all, the farmers are giving us their own impression, their own assessment of the cassava varieties. Now, remember we're dealing with 320 farmers. This technology is quite cost effective and we're reaching out to a great number of farmers who are giving us the research information that is beneficial to the breeders. Because whatever the breeder breeds, the, end, the recipient of that are the farmers. So we involve farmers from the beginning, men and women, because we want the outcome to be beneficial to them. And again, okay. these farmers are very excited that they are working with us because they, they think they are part of a research, um, cassava research, and actually they are part of research. And we are also mm -hmm. excited that uh, we <clears throat> are getting the desired result from them. Remember I said that it is a well-informed thorough gender analysis. So from they want we do that. And like I said, we do a lot of, uh, we, what we do is try to identify the cassava traits preferences. 
their priorities, realities of both men and women. And all these their yeah, trade preferences and priorities and real, uh, realities are adequately addressed and des uh, implemented and all of them are put into the design and application in the next gen breeding pipeline. So the breeders, we give them the information from the field that they need. If their breeding okay. now is like demand driven, yes. We get what the farmers need and we'll move it to the breeders. That's why we, we, we are quite important in this aspect. And the breeding that Next Gen is doing is quite different from every other one because it's quite a gender responsive uh, breeding. Uh, Tessie, okay. I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Um, I, I've interviewed you once before and you told me that uh, cassava is like a bank account for a lot of the people who grow it and especially uh, the women who grow it. And I, I, I wanted you to elaborate on that point about why um, is this crop so adaptable and um, important for the women farmers of Nigeria whom you've worked with? Um, you, you rightly said it. Cassava is like a bank to the women. And women are the major growers of cassava, especially in the Southeast. And when you look at the value chain, apart from uh, the land preparation, every other aspect of the, uh, uh, the, the production chain, I mean, the, in the field are, are taken care of by women. And uh, we're looking at these varieties, cassava, these varieties that are released, which are going to enable the women scale out and increase in their area of, um, uh, uh, area of land devoted to cassava production, as well as increase their supply to the market, this invariably will also increase um, their income. And we are looking at these varieties um, which possess the desired traits that these farmers require. And we're, we're looking at and uh, you know, opening up new commercial opportunities along the cassava value chain for small scale farmers, most especially. And when this opportunity These are open because these uh, new varieties had uh, trade preferences. We expect that their income will increase and also this will invariably affect their health and education. So most of the income will be spent on health and education. Okay, um, thank you, Tessie. But I, I also um, would like to add on the cassava working as a bank. Correct me if I'm, if, if, if I'm not if I'm not correct. And okay, cassava maybe takes I nine didn't, months. Maybe I didn't hear him well. No, what did he I, say I'm, I'm okay. just adding something. Cassava takes um, nine months until um, maturity. That means when someone plants their cassava, it's like, um, it's like putting away your money and in a fixed deposit account on, for, for it to gain, um, to gain interest and then nine months later you get it out and like you said you use it on either health or the education of your children right yeah and again on cassava uh, being your bank because they do piecemeal harvesting so ah. they harvest when the need arises when mm -hmm. there is need especially during festive period or occasion that requires them to um spend money like school fees and um, hospital bills. So that is also why the, the cassava is like a bank. So they can always go back to their bank, harvest, um, and also use to uh, sort out some of the challenges they are facing. That is a great analogy. Thank you very much, um, Tessie. But there is one thing that I'm sure um, our participants would like to understand more, just, just briefly. Tell us what these, um, especially the women preferences, the women farmer preferences, you can give us just two, that men generally preferred um, a, a variety that has this, these characteristics and women tended to look out for these characteristics, just to help us understand this gender differentiation. Okay, thank you very much. Men generally would like um, cassava that will give them higher fresh uh, root yield because they want to sell them off immediately. And also um, early maturing cassava. 
they want, also want to sell them off because it's a business for them. The women, in as much as they like um, um, cassava that will give them high fresh uh, root yield, they are also more interested in the product yield. When I mean product, I mean product like Gary and Fufu. What is that cassava variety giving them at the end of processing? And uh, women are also interested in the food aspect of uh, the variety because of the culinary um, uh, benefits of the food. The color is, in, it is important to them. The, the texture of the final product is important to them. The, okay. the, um, the rating ability for those who do fufu is the cassava they are, they are using, can it ferment within a specified period of time? And when it ferments, does it, or do they ferment all so that they are not losing out? So these new varieties are offering them some of these, they are required threat preferences. Okay, um, Tessie, I'll stay with you just ever so briefly. Um, um, you were, when... <laughs> Sorry, I was, I, I was distracted a little bit. Let us, um, let us move now to, to our questions. And yeah. I think the first question came from Robert. Robert is watching us via Facebook and he's asking, um, are any of these varieties, have they been bred using genetic modification or genetic engineering? Um, I saw Chidozi answering that in the chat, but I would like for you Chidozi to, 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 to um, explain to people who may, who may not have read the answer in the chat. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, Robert was wondering which of the five varieties were developed through ge genetic engineering or genetic modification. And my answer is that um, much as um, next gen cassava agrees and believes that the power of science and technology in, <clears throat> in the development of gen genetic engineering or genetically engineered crops is valid, it is not yet our business plan. It is not yet in our business plan. So none of the varieties we release or we plan to release even in the near future um, in any part of the world, not just Nigeria is um, derived from genetic engineering. So that's the point I wanted to make. So what we did is to do conventional breeding but powered by genomic selection. Genomic selection is a predictive modeling that you use the SNP data from the DNA sequences of the plants and you're able to match them together with the field data that you got, we were able to select those varieties. So there is a power of biotechnology, but it's not genetic engineering. It's important to distinguish that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chidozi. Um, Tessie, I had lost my train of thought earlier, but now I am back to you. Um, we, 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 because today we are talking about um, food and nutrition security and also incomes, okay? Mm, um, mm. The, 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 the increase in income is quite very clear when, when I think it's Dr. Kayondo who told us that there is um, a 20% 20 a 20 increase in, in, in the final product like Fufu and Gari. So we see clearly how the farmers are going to get more money. Um, we see clearly in terms of yield and, and disease resistance, meaning that farmers are going to lose little or nothing to, di to disease, hence more yield, and more yield means more food available to, to the population. What I, not, what I am not picking up clearly on is the nutrition. Yes, I am satisfied with all the starch and carbohydrates. What else in terms of micronutrients is, is there? Yeah, this um, the we have um, those ones in the um, yellow cassava, um, orange, um, yellow root cassava, that um, was supported by Harvest Plus, and uh, those ones are rich in uh, beta carotene, which is also very essential for uh, children under the age of five and uh, women in their productive age bracket. 
So we have a, a, a wide variety of cassava that people can access from. If you're talking about uh, nutrition and micronutrients, then the yellow root cassava is there available for people to, to access and increase in their um, nutrition security. Okay, thank you, Tessie. Now let me go. Um, let me go to the section of questions, and I will. I may not necessarily direct the question to anyone. If you feel comfortable to answer it, please, please go ahead. Um, Abba Simon Peter is saying five percent dry matter increase is a lot. Kudos to Next Gen Cassava. So it's well done to Next Gen ITA and Umudike National Roots Crops Research Institute and all your partners there. Um, Robert is saying, no, 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 we, we've already um, addressed Robert's question. Um, Benjamin Okoye is saying, great gender differentiation, Tessie, kudos. Christopher Knight, who is also our um, my co-host today is, is asking a question. Is there a disconnect with respect to knowledge of cassava nutritional content between farmer and consumer? And that um, question is from Kathleen Hepron on Facebook. Is, is there a disconnect uh, with the, the knowledge of cassava nutritional content between farmer and consumer? I'm not sure if I understand the question, uh, but how do farmers and consumers view the nutritional aspect of cassava and are there differences in, in knowledge and expectations about that? Um, Dr. Rabi, do you want to, to answer that? I saw Shedozi uh, rare. Yeah, into... I think I can, I can take that. Okay. Maybe you take the brown streak one. There's a question on brown streak. I want one of you to take, or both of you to take. Um, is there a disconnect with respect to so in, in West Africa, um, people really would eat uh, cassava alone. It's eating with a combination of sauce or soup, as we call it here. And then maybe some protein sauce like fish and um, meat. Um, given, I mean, most of the people who grow them are poor, who grow the crop are poor farmers. So they probably don't have that luxury to provide those protein sources. But is clear from history, from you know, having grown the crop for for so many cent uh, centuries. We've been growing cassava in West Africa since the 16th, 17th century. So the, there's an understanding that it's not going to give you everything you need. But as far as calories are concerned, that it can give you 80% of your calorie needs. And um, about 10 years ago, we we released from the National Root Crop Research Institute and IIT, we released um, pro-vitamin A cassava. So that uh, cassava that is ordinarily will give maybe your 10% or less of your um, body requirements for vitamin A, you have that, those varieties, six of them, those six varieties providing you uh, about with, with about 50% of your body needs for vitamin A, daily requirements for vitamin A. So that is what we have been able to market. But this set of five varieties that we released are not it. We are hopeful that in the next one year or by the end of 2021, all things being equal and uh, um, lockdown not impacting, that we'll be able to step up again to release a new uh, product profile of biofortified cassava. So in Nigeria and as well as the DRC, Ghana, and now in Uganda, we have biofortified cassava varieties that farmers are really interested and keen on because they understand that the regular one they've been growing that are white roots do not have vitamin A and that these ones are biofortified. So there is an understanding, uh, but it is still an advocacy that is needed. And that is what we are doing. Next gen is collaborating with Harvest Plus and we are using um, genomic selection and even molecular markers that we're developing to in increase the speed with which we, we develop those, develop and select those um, biofortified uh, varieties. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chidozi. Um, our next question is from Mark Linus, who is asking how prevalent is the brown streak disease currently and is this affecting livelihoods? 
So, Dr. Abian Kayondo, that is yours. Uh, I'll go you have first. more questions. Please be brief. Yes. Uh, cassava brown streak is uh, right now confined to African continents, predominantly uh, Eastern Africa uh, and some regions of West Central Africa. And it's slowly moving towards um, this part of the world. We hope that it doesn't come here. But in the meantime, the breeding programs in West Africa are carrying out what we call preemptive breeding in collaboration with our partners in East Africa, specifically Tanzania and Uganda and Kenya to see if we can have varieties that are ready for that disease should it reach this uh, part of the world. And uh, Ismail is from Uganda, so he can tell us his experience about how devastating this disease can be. Yeah, as, uh, as Ismail has uh, highlighted, cassava uh, brown streak is, a, is an important disease for the cassava producing communities, in the sense that it, it has, it, where the epidemics hit high, you can get 100% loss. And this is really critical for uh, communities that depend on cassava for livelihood. So we find it also uh, doing a lot of uh, challenge for, in terms of dry matter uh, reduction for especially for those that are looking at cassava for industry. So it's a disease that we are looking at seriously because we don't want to see cassava uh, becoming a, uh, being challenged on the continent because of the disease. So like we've been, uh, we've been collaborating with breeding programs in East Africa to do preemptive breeding. And the idea is to see that we develop genetic stocks that can be able to resist and withstand the, uh, uh, the virus as it, uh, as it evolves. Like we've been seeing the viruses, uh, uh, the current pandemic in humans for uh, COVID-19, the virus is also evolving. So we are trying to see that we arm ourselves with those varieties that respond to the evolving virus. And some of the varieties that we are releasing in Uganda and Tanzania are actually resistant and tolerant to some of those strains that are uh, challenging. We are actually collaborating with very, uh, 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 very, uh, with very various partners in Europe like winters, uh, uh, winters lab uh, that are known to do uh, virology, and they're actually backstopping our potential to be able to identify those virus resistant uh, clones. So we expect okay. to be- Dr. Kayondo, please allow me to cut you short and ask you um, another question, just very directly. Um, brown streak disease, let's say in Uganda, what is the percentage of yield loss? Does it give a particular farmer, one farmer? So in, in a survey that was done uh, around 2017 uh, uh, in the, the central districts of Uganda, we could actually, we found out that around or between 70 to, uh, uh, to 80% loss at three months and six months. So if the disease strikes at that level, actually even earlier, you expect 100%. So it means that for, the, for example, for Uganda, we see many high yielding varieties. When the disease came out, in the, uh, when it was, the disease was first cited in, in 2000, most of those varieties were lost by the farmers. And because we've had okay. this collaborative type of breeding, we see that West Africa was able to backstop. So we see that it's a serious disease that can, any disease that can cause 100% yield loss is a serious disease, and we don't take it lightly. So, okay, of, so. This disease causes 70 to 100% yield loss, but it's also leading to the disappearance of varieties, yes? Yeah, because Did I most, get that right? most of the times farmers, the best way they can consult their varieties in the field, and uh, this is where actually the, well, the varieties that farmers use get exposed to some of these diseases, and they end up saying uh, diseases run off there, uh, uh, being lost from them. Okay, so how, how, just please give me a direct answer. How does brown streak um, present? So brown streak can present itself in a, in a number of forms. For example, in the foliar, you definitely see yellow necrotic lesions along the veins on the leaf. And those are really peculiar, peculiar from the lower leaves going upwards. But also the, there are some streaks which are like scars on the stem of the plant. So many times when a farmer sees this, even before harvesting a plant to see the root, 
you definitely see there are uh, vivid signals for us to be able to see that ground strike is actually in operation. But again, the most challenging bit of it is, um, is the roofs, which creates the necrotic lesions within the roof. So the roof becomes yellow, uh, brownish, and uh, okay. uh, that brown okay. thing is incompatible. Actually, the most variety is actually uh, bitter. So people, it's not something that even an animal can eat. So it Thank you, Dr. Kayondo. Let us continue. Um, Doc, Robert, Robert is asking, um, does leaving the tuber in the ground longer than nine months, does the tuber continue to grow? He's asking after nine months, what happens? We only have 10 more minutes, five more questions. Anyone taking that, please be brief. If you leave the yes, tuber the in the ground for more than nine months. Right, so uh, for even more than 12 months, they will continue to mature or bulk up depending on the varieties. I, I've put an answer on the chat box for that. Um, so the okay. ones we've released are between 10 to 12 months. Um, John, John Martin is, yes, thank you. After beyond nine, 12 months, it will continue to grow. John Martin is asking who will own the varieties and how will they be distributed? Will farmers be able to trade, swap and multiply these varieties? Um, that to the last question, I think it is yes. So, but who will distribute these varieties? I can answer that. So mm -hmm. we have a sister project in Nigeria called the Building Sustainable uh, Cassava Seed Systems, BASICS. And the goal of this project uh, actually is to modernize the seed system. Traditionally, cassava seeds is informally exchanged between farmers, sometimes through the extension agents and so on. And in most cases, you have varieties that are officially released that end up in the shelf. But the whole objective of the basics project is to act as a vehicle to transport the new varieties after release and put them in the hands of the farmers, but in a commercially uh, and, uh, and formal uh, way. So where they can guarantee the quality of the variety meaning the purity of the, of the planting material, the quality mm -hmm. of the seeds that they are giving, ensuring that they are disease-free and so on. So that project is helping us in that. But by and large, farmers are free to uh, share the materials, but we are also considering uh, how we can uh, formalize the cassava seed system in Nigeria. Okay, thank you. Um, Isaac Nkechi is asking, is there any discount on the seeds? This was a public philanthropic development effort. Is there any discount or, or in case you're actually asking, is it going to be given away free? Um, I, I think she that. does, that is your question. Yes, so thank you. Um, the, 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 the whole thing we are doing is that agriculture is not, um, uh, we, we have to treat agriculture as a business and that's the, that's the motivation for anybody to get involved. So we are providing, that we, are, we, are, we have been advocating that growing seed and marketing seed, you know, taking part in the seed value chain is a, is a, is a new and is, is, is something that we should encourage young people, youth to get into agriculture and see seed value chain as an opportunity. So these seeds, doing, giving these seeds away will be a, a disincentive to what we have been doing. The youth empl employment, the, the youth agripreneur system that we're trying to encourage, the uh, uh, agribusiness that we're trying to encourage. You cannot be doing agribusiness and doing it free. So what we can do is that the sister project that we talked about, basics that um, Ishmael talked about, is to support those um, poor farmers by giving them um, some some support, some level of support to become seed entrepreneurs, community seed entrepreneurs, but they will mm. have to buy seed and they will have to sell seed. So that is what we are working on, working on that logistic. But we, the era for giving us seed for free is over. So we, 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 we are working on that to make sure that everybody is um, uh, motivated to make agriculture a business. Okay, um, we are right on time, just five more minutes. And um, Samar Shiat, um, this one, the panelists don't have to answer. He's saying if um, cassava brown streak virus were to arrive in Nigeria, a certain variety would be lost. Um, our panelists have told us that they're working on it. They are using preemptive 
breeding and they are in, you know, in partnership with people in East Africa and elsewhere to ensure that it doesn't um, continue to go forward to continue to West Africa and beyond. But should it arrive, they are ready with solutions. So as we finish, I would like um, just closing remarks. Um, Chidozi, I know you want to go off quickly in the next one minute. So if you could just give us um, your closing remark, look at it this way. If our panelists were to forget everything that we've talked about today, sorry, our participants, what is that one thing that you would want them to go away with? Chidozi. Right. So that next gen cassava breeding project is here to deliver the best bet varieties. And we've done it in Nigeria. We know that the potential impact is going to have is huge because of the demand we, we foresaw and we've helped to nurture for new varieties. And um, we are we'll built to do the same in East Africa, Uganda, starting with Uganda and then Tanzania. Um, so you can really see the results of um, science and tech in improving the lives of uh, smallholder farmers in Africa. Our whole work is around smallholder farmers in Af Sub-Saharan Africa, and that is what we want to improve on, to make them be empowered to grow foods that will make them more secure, nutritionally secure, and also income secure. Thank you. Thank you, Chidozi. And please feel free to go to your next meeting. Um, then to Tessie. Tessie, what is your closing remark today? My closing remark is that um, NextGen did, has done well because everybody, the, the final recipients of the research work were involved and their voice came out very loud in the release of these uh, varieties and also in the breeding pipeline where they gave them all the threat preferences that they needed. The threat, the threat preferences of men and women were considered greatly in the breeding uh, of these uh, five cassava varieties that were released. And again, there's something I wanted to mention that is important, apart from all the benefits that this uh, cassava is giving, it gave a, a social, there's a social benefit or social angle to it. The women were given a voice. There's mm -hmm. a voice in what they did. Because in one of our um, uh, farmers uh, field, the farmer told us that before we came to uh, ne before Next Gen came to their community, she was an entity and nobody was talking or listening to her. She didn't have a voice, but she was involved in some of our trials. And now she has become a reference point for other farmers in that community. So the social angle is that we have given a voice to her. We've also given a voice to the voiceless because their voices were heard loud and clear in the release of these five uh, varieties. Thank you. Thank you, Tessie. And um, thank you for giving women a voice and making them visible. Dr. Ismail Kayondo, please your parting remarks. Thank you very much and thank you to the listeners. Uh, one important thing we need to take at the end of the day is that breeding is very important to the left to breed us alone. The breeders and the social economists have done their part. They have evolved the varieties. It is now each other person's responsibility to see that these varieties move far and wide to ensure that we see Africa move towards the development of uh, the industries that we are looking towards and trying to ensure that we fight hunger and uh, improve the life of the people. So when we do that, then our mission together will be achieved. So let's work together. Let's see how these varieties can be promoted and grown on a larger scale as we prepare for some pandemics like CVSD CVSV and many others that are, that are here to come to ensure that we can be able to bring them down and ensure that we can move along with the yield that uh, everyone is looking out for. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Kayondo, for that call to teamwork. And finally, Dr. Ismail Rabi. Mm. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I would just like to maybe say a few things regarding how, what next gen uh, means uh, to, to the continent. 
NextGen has demonstrated that we can modernize a breeding program for a crop that until very recently was considered an orphan crop in many parts of the world, especially in Africa. It was really under-researched. Very few institutions were it's working on it. Clock. But through NextGen project, we have brought together world-class partnerships involving um, North American universities, uh, CGR centers, leading national programs in Africa. Second thing we have done is that we have built the capacity uh, for the next generation of breeders. We have trained dozens of PhD and master students from around the continent who have gone back to their institutions and are leading uh, in the efforts of the, developing the next set of varieties. These five sets of varieties are not the only ones from next gen. These are just from the first cycles of population improvements. We collectively have done up to four or five cycles of population improvements. We have new products in the pipeline that in a few years time when they hit the market, we hope that they would you know, be able to even surpass the ones that we have released uh, at the moment. So uh, it's, it's a process. Uh, we have not reached um, yeah. the, 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 the final goal. Breeding is always continuous and we hope that we can keep up with the demand. Okay, thank you, Dr. Arabi. Um, just to remind ourselves that um, this webinar has been brought to you by the Cornell Alliance for Science. And at the Cornell Alliance for Science, we are for science, we are for agriculture. So well done, well done. Just a reminder, these five varieties are Game Changer, Hope, Batanjo, Baba, and Poundable. Everyone who has joined us today, thank you very much. See you next Thursday, same place, um, same time, maybe um, same day. You can check our website, Alliance of Science or AFS Live to see what is coming up next. And Chris Knight, who's been helping us with the technical aspect and my co-host today. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Have a good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Bye-bye. Bye. There are so many opportunities in the cassava value chain.